So my talk today is going to be about mechanical property prediction because when you're creating a new material, you need structure and properties at the same time. And there really aren't any fundamental methods of calculating most of the properties that uh, engineers are interested in. And if you look at this website, all the software and data that I will talk about, uh, you can download freely from that website. And the work is described comprehensively in this particular review, which I'll come back to uh, at the end as well. So I'm going to present very little detail, given that I have uh, 25 minutes to do this. So first I will briefly explain to you how machine learning works. So basically machine learning involves creating a mathematical function which will fit a set of data that you either collect from the literature or are available during routine quality control procedures. Uh, and it's a mathematical function that is sufficiently complex uh, that you can deal with any level of complexity in your data. So this is a particularly simple movie that I'm showing you, which only has four hyperbolic tangent functions. But in a real model, you can have any number of these functions and make your surface as flexible as you like for any number of variables. In other words, you can fit any level of complicated problem given given the data and many people consider this to be a black box approach uh, but in fact it is completely transparent uh, however complicated my machine learning model is it is expressed by a single equation here where this is your output and uh, you have your inputs here and various uh, constants just as in regression analysis and all of these coefficients, et cetera, are completely transparent. So you can look inside the model and decide, you know, which variables are having a bigger effect than others and how do, how do those coefficients change when you change one or more variable. So you can have thousands of variables uh, as, as long as you have the data and an infinitely complicated mathematical function, which is described by a single very long equation. OK, but it's completely transparent. There's nothing black box about this method. The most important uh, thing to worry about is that if you have a very flexible mathematical function, then you can make it pass through every single point and get a perfect fit. And we know, uh, you know, just from the previous discussion that uh, data will not be perfectly accurate. So you do not actually create one mathematical function, but you create hundreds of mathematical functions, all of which uh, will represent your experimental data fairly well okay, within your uh, expected noise, but which will behave differently in extrapolation. So here you have uh, uh, an illustration that look uh, all three functions here uh, reasonably fit the experimental data, but they behave differently in domains where we do not have knowledge. All right. And remember, we are dealing with a uh, multidimensional space, but this is just an illustration of Y against X. So you find functions which reasonably fit the experimental data within your expected sort of level of noise that you get from your experience in the problem, and they will extrapolate differently. Now, this is not something to worry about. This simply indicates to you uh, two things. First, that you're working in a domain where there isn't knowledge, and that really is the domain where you're interested because you're doing something new. Uh, if you're working in this region, you don't actually need to do any experiments. And the deviation of the functions beyond your data indicates the level of what we call the modeling uncertainty. That means your actual result could lie anywhere within that region. And that is the level of uncertainty you have to cope with. And this also defines a domain where you need to do an experiment okay, uh, to validate, uh, validate the prediction. So this kind of an error bar, which is not your statistical error bar, 
but is a modeling uncertainty. That means we don't actually know which model is a correct representation of the problem is extremely important in, uh, in using machine learning. And it's a very valuable piece of information, not only to direct experiments, but to take a risk in a region where we don't know enough. There is another kind of uh, problem which cannot actually be solved. So supposing I presented you with this sequence of numbers and asked you to predict the next two numbers in the series, then the most logical person would say 10 and 12. Okay, so there's absolutely no noise in the initial data and you made a prediction uh, based on a linear model. But, you know, if you use this equation here and you put in two, uh, you will get exactly four, okay? And if you put in four, you'll get exactly six. And if you put in six, you'll get exactly eight. But if you put in eight, you will get 8.91 and, and so on. So both of these models, the linear model and this nonlinear model, exactly represent the noiseless data that I've created. Uh, as illustrated over here, they fit the experimental data in, in without any deviation from the two models, but they behave completely different, differently outside of the knowledge base. This problem cannot be solved, but it is once again a modeling uncertainty, which tells you that look, if you actually use your predictions in this region, then you're taking a certain amount of risk. So the common dangers of extrapolation are reduced in the sense that you have a warning here that be careful. Now, there's a lot more to machine learning than what I've presented, but it's described in the review paper that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to go into examples to show you whether or not this technique is useful in predicting mechanical properties which cannot be predicted in any other way. So this is a very common problem. Bo Sunman has already uh, talked about it, this a little, uh, that we have, uh, we, we need to produce uh, metals which can operate at temperatures in excess of 700 degrees centigrade uh, under steam pressures of, uh, you know, something like 30 megapascals. Uh, for, for steam power plant. Uh, and the reason, of course, is that we get a greater thermodynamic efficiency. But there are no steels, actually. After many, many decades of research all over the world, there are no steels which can survive, no ferritic steels which can survive this sort of a condition over a period of 40 years and a stress levels of the order of 100 megapascals. And Ferritic steels are important because the thermal expansion coefficient is just right to avoid problems of thermal fatigue and uh, uh, creep fatigue. Rosnodic steels can cope, but they fail very quickly because their thermal expansion coefficient is very large compared with ferrite. Now, nickel happens to have almost the same thermal expansion coefficient as ferrite. Uh, and, you know, we use, uh, you, we use nickel alloys at much higher temperatures and much higher stresses in aircraft engines. But those alloys are incredibly expensive if you want to make something very large. Uh, you know, the, the cost of uh, one of these uh, nickel-based uh, turbine blades, just the material cost, is the same as its weight in silver. So there is no possibility of making large objects out of the sort of alloys that we use in aircraft engines. However, we don't want to go to temperatures uh, of 1400 degrees centigrade, uh, which is typical in an aircraft engine. We want to achieve something like 700 degrees centigrade. So we decided that we would re-engineer nickel-based alloys to remove all the expensive elements and design it for operation at 700 degrees centigrade. And uh, using our machine learning methods, we, uh, in combination with uh, things like thermocalc and empty data and uh, microstructure models and so on, we came up with an alloy here. And we call this alloy FT750DC. FT is Frank Tonkre, who did 
did the work, uh, my postdoc who did the work, and we designed it for 750 degrees centigrade steam temperature. Uh, and DC stands for dirt cheap. Okay, so dirt, dirt cheap because this is so much cheaper than the sort of nickel based alloys that we use in aircraft engines. And it even includes iron so that we can use scrap material. Iron is not good actually to have in the alloy. But nevertheless, if you want to use scrap materials, then you need to include it. And we only need about 20% of gamma prime. So uh, we designed it for that purpose. Now, of course, the property that we are looking for is strength and creep resistance at high temperatures. And what I want to show you in this graph is that uh, the project was only a three year project. And um, this represents the modeling uncertainty. OK, so we collected a huge amount of data on all kinds of nickel based alloys and created a machine learning model. And these are the modeling uncertainties. These are the experimental points when we manufactured the alloy and actually made it. OK, so you can see that in spite of the large modeling uncertainty, uh, the strength is being predicted well. Uh, and of course, creep tests tests take a very long time. Um, this again is our modeling uncertainty, and these are the actual experimental data. So even when your modeling uncertainty is right, if you have chosen your input parameters carefully, and I'll illustrate that later, then you will make sensible predictions in domains where there are no, uh, there is no knowledge. And that is the domain where researchers want to work in. Now, here's a, another example where we were asked to design a welding alloy for uh, uh, high temperature applications. And I emphasize once again that you cannot do a design like this using one model or another, but you have to have a whole cluster of uh, methods. Uh, and you'll hear about many of these methods as we go along this uh, wonderful meeting today. But mechanical properties, the only way is to use machine learning. There are absolutely no models which will allow you to predict the creep rate, the fatigue properties, even the simple stress strain diagram for the sort of complex materials that we deal with. Now, Nippon Steel, uh, while we were doing our own work, Nippon Steel created some new alloys and did tests, uh, tests, very expensive tests over a long period of time. And we took those data to assess the models that we were creating. And once again, you know, look at the modeling uncertainties. We managed to predict their data extremely well in spite of the very large modeling uncertainties uh, because you can make your machine learning model as physical as possible by choosing inputs that have real meaning. So having uh, tested our model on completely new data, uh, we made our own welding alloys for our own application. And with the first set of materials created, we managed to achieve all of the targets that were set by the engineers. However, I want to now illustrate a failure, uh, not, not success. So the material was designed to, uh, to serve at around 560 degrees centigrade. So for that application, we meet all the targets. But we decided to do experiments at even higher temperatures. And you can see that here something is going very wrong. It's well outside of our modeling uncertainty or our statistical errors. So the experiments are in huge disagreement with our prediction. So this gives you uh, uh, a motivation to investigate. So this is, these are just uh, um, optical micrographs of the well metal. And this is the sort of structure that we expect uh, without going into details. And everything is fine until we get to the place where we have a lot of disagreement between the 
machine learning model and the experimental data. And you can see that there is something strange going on here, is that the material is recrystallizing at 700 degrees centigrade. Now, once you've identified that problem, it's very easy to solve it by adding uh, a small concentration of vanadium, which spins the boundaries. And then you end up with a successful commercial uh, material. So even when your predictions are going wrong because some of the physics is missing from your machine learning model, you can gain from that by doing targeted experiments. Now, I want to finish off by showing you how well machine learning actually generalizes. So we needed to create models for fatigue. And fatigue, you know, 99% of engineering failures come from fatigue, okay? Uh, it is a slow process and then you suddenly get fast fracture. So it is a very dangerous kind of failure if your component is a critical component. Of course, there are huge quantities of data available in the literature, and there's a, a, an enormous effort uh, involved in actually collecting those data and then looking at the physics of the problem and selecting which variables you are going to use. So we, are, we were interested in steels, and we collected data on elongation strength, uh, loading mode like shear or um, you know um, tension, and two different kinds of in-plane and out-plane shear. And uh, sample size, uh, stress ratio, frequency, stress intensity range. Now these, uh, these um, uh, I'm not going to discuss in detail, but think of these as uh, partial correlation coefficients. In other words, how much does this variable influence the uh, final fatigue properties, okay? It's more complicated than I've just explained, but think of it as a partial correlation coefficient. So we created the models and then we began to test them against completely unseen data. And you can see that we predict the crack growth rate uh, well in steels that were not included in the database used for training. But now I want to show you something quite extraordinary. So if I, if I go back one uh, slide, there's nothing in the input variables that tells you that we are working on steels. Okay, absolutely nothing. This could apply to any material when you do a fatigue test. So if I now apply the model which is created on data only on steels to other materials, it should work. And look, uh, this is really I, uh, quite extraordinary that the model predicts well for nickel alloys. Okay. No nickel alloys included in the database, and it works for titanium and aluminum alloys. None of those included in the database. So that is what I meant by choosing the inputs of your machine learning model as carefully as you can to make it as physical as possible. So even the threshold fatigue uh, this is called the threshold, you know, where you have a very, very small crack growth rate, is predicted really quite well. So I'll finish off now and emphasize once again that no single model is suitable for solving all the problems. You need a whole bank of uh, mathematical methods, and none of these mathematical models will give you a precise prediction but it will help you to reduce the number of experiments that you have to do in order to get to your goal. And these modeling techniques are all described in this uh, small book that we created, Introduction to Materials Modeling, uh, not just machine learning, but all the different techniques we are going to discuss today. And this is the review that I would recommend if you want to uh, learn a bit more about machine learning. So I'll be happy to answer question, assuming I've left uh, enough time for discussion. Okay. So please feel free for, for questions. Uh, questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi. 
Uh, so if you uh, you apply, you have a model, and then you apply to different materials. So uh, what is the physical um, uh, is, uh, uh, in the end when we squeeze all, all what what is the uh, rest of the physics that can be so versatile? Yeah. So essentially, uh, the input variables that we used have no information about the actual material. You know, they're all engineering inputs. So for example, the sample size, shape, the frequency of loading, and so on. And those are the basic parameters that are used in all fatigue tests uh, for correct growth rate. So in principle, the model you create should apply to any material which uses. But then you kill our, our work. You don't need the chemistry. Uh, as I explained to you, this is just one aspect of a materials design problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Okay. If if uh, Ludovic doesn't see my raised hand, then I just jump in. Um, Harry, at at the time when you wrote the uh, the review, I was also uh, doing similar work and testing it and I actually failed a little bit because I had the impression that the uh, learning algorithms were not uh, really uh, well and then in the in the 2000s in the years 2000 uh, this machine learning was it became very quiet uh, around the topic and 10 years uh, later uh, let's say five years before or seven years before it's very popular again can you comment on the on the importance of the learning and training algorithms. Yeah, so the research that I used um, basically is a single layer of the, what's known as the hidden unit. Okay, And before the year 2000, that became very well established. So the people in machine learning didn't think that there was any further advance to be made until, uh, you know, the um, deep mind came up with a multi-layer network uh, and how to solve the problem of finding the coefficients with the multi-layer um, neural network. And then it took off again because it opened up the possibility of even more complex problems. My own feeling is that in materials, you do not need anything more than one hidden unit because the problem is you have to collect the data, and that is a really tedious task. Whereas uh, the sort of work that DeepMind and so on are doing, uh, they have access to vast databases, for example, from the health service and so on. So I, I think, you know, to begin with, uh, the single layer neural network does extremely well as long as you take account of the error bars, you know, modeling uncertainties. 